Hello and welcome to The Arise interview where we take time to reflect on the big stories from the news and on the fortunes and affairs of the world in an hour of conversation with commentators, analysts and thought leaders. I'm Charles Anyagolo. Coming up in the next 60 minutes, my special guest today is Miata Fanbule. And across the footlights of enduring African music, she's considered to be one of the finest and most influential African female vocalists of modern times. A woman who's become a legend in her own time, a revolutionary singer, songwriter and producer with a playlist to die for. From modern cuts to classic oldies, Miata's music is quite simply timeless. Who can ever forget such massive sing-along classic songs as Amo Sakesa and Kokolioko, songs that set the stage for her long, eventful and continuing career in the entertainment business. The magnificent Miata Fambule, one of the true giants of African song, coming up. Now, after more than five decades in the music business, she's become one of the most recognizable figures in African entertainment. My special guest today is the captivating singer, songwriter and producer Miata Fambule, affectionately known as Didi or the Doyen Diva of Liberian music. Born in Monrovia, Liberia, educated in Sierra Leone, Kenya, the UK and the US, she has enchanted audiences in Nigeria, across Africa and around the world since the 1970s with a voice that one writer described as sweet and haunting with the magic of the sea, the eternal fire of the mother drum and the sensual perfume of high mysterious mountains. Now that may sound a bit over the top until you hear Miata in full cry. Take a listen to one of her biggest hits ever. This one's called Amo Sakesa. positively gawping with awe as I introduce my special guest today, the utterly sensational Miata Fambule. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. You, you really have no idea, do you? No. I mean, Charles, I, you're saying all those things and I'm like looking around. <laughs> really? Well, I got news for you. We're talking about you. <laughs> The famous Miata <laughs> Fambule. Thank you very much indeed. Still we are. Surviving. I am deeply honored oh. and and you come from beyond being an absolutely famous hit maker yourself i mean you come from quite a pedigreed background don't you your father a liberian politician diplomat mm -hmm. former ambassador your younger sister a former foreign minister your younger brother, former foreign minister and national security advisor. Your mother, a goodwill ambassador. Oh, mother was a giant. And, and women's advocate. I mean, yes. how did that, all of that affect you as you grew up? You, you seem like a pretty ordinary person. That's what I thought. That's what I thought, you know, Charles. And, and as I was driving over here, thinking, 
you know, how I will be able to answer some of your questions relating to the activism and rebelness. <laughs> it, <laughs> I like it, that. It, yeah, it started, I realized it started ever since. Um, in school in Sierra Leone, I was ready to wage, you know, all kinds of wars. I had my friends, we got up to things. Everybody knew I was the gang leader. <laughs> yes, and then we went to Nairobi, and it was the same thing. I was always the rebel in the front and so forth. So I don't know if it came from the genes or being around those caliber people. My grandfather, maternal grandfather, was quite a giant. Mm, yes, I read about it. You know, well. so it's always been there in my life. I guess that you're supposed to speak out and you're supposed to stand up. Mm and you're supposed to not be afraid. And of course, you mentioned that you went to school in Sierra Leone, although you, you are, of course, I from Liberia, yes. uh, but you were there because your father was the Liberian ambassador right. um, in Sierra Leone. And you also went to school in Kenya. Same, same um, thing. And of course, you, you also lived in, in Liberia because you are a Liberian. Mm -hmm. um, did all that give you a sort of pan-African perspective always. as you grew up? Always, always, because, um, in the home, let's start off with, um, okay, we went to England first. Mm. And of course, I was in a British boarding school there with other Liberians and other Africans. And so, um, yes, it started from there. There was a Nigerian, there was Jamaican, etc. But I think f for me, it probably started in Sierra Leone because um, father's doors were open not only to the Sierra Leoneans, but other nationalities that came in. So we grew up with South Africans coming through the embassy and Zimbabweans and mm. all those people. And the same thing happened in Kenya. So yes, um, we always had access to um, the African leaders who were going through, those who were in exile and um, could come by and stuff, knew them by names, called them uncles. So I think all of that, yes, did have a Mm. some kind of an impact on and, and, and imagine after all of that i mean having rubbed shoulders with the big the famous the the rich across africa father ambassador you know mm. grandfather well-known sort of politician and then you dropped out to become a singer in monrovia chaos. now ca i can imagine that's the word chaos <laughs> because i mean you're chaos. talking about a traditional yeah. african family upwardly mobile and um and you know all this education good education i was at the annie walsh in sierra leone i was at the kenya high in mm. kenya and everything you mean all this education is going to go to waste with you standing up like a band girl in those days, you know, band girls, uh, the wild girls. They were supposed to be quite naughty, weren't they? Yes, yeah. and they stood up in front with musicians. But I always, I always loved being around musicians in Sierra Leone. I mean, thank God he's dead and gone now. But in Sierra Leone, at 14, 15 years old, I was running away from the embassy to go and listen to Geraldo Pino and the Heartbeats. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinary, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> but of course, you... you in spite of the fact that you started mm -hmm. singing and you were rebellious and you knew what you wanted, which is a very commendable thing, that sort of thing is supported today, mm -hmm. whereas then it would be frowned upon, mm -hmm. um, you still had to go and get a formal degree. There was no getting away from oh, school. So you, you went off to the US yes. and you had to study journalism. Yes, well, I started off with the journalism mm. and uh, he, the same father, talked me out of it. So that is when I took on the music seriously. I went to the American Musical and Dramatic Academy. But I loved journalism. Um, I had a few little stints doing broadcasting. Mm. I mean, my, my sense of journalism was the broadcasting on radio, TV, the CNNs of, mm. and BBCs that we have today. Um, father then were more concerned, I think, in the literary journalists who could get picked up in the middle of the night and never seen again and so forth. So he warned me about that and I thought it was a very good advice. Um, stay singing. And the wonderful thing about singing is you can, you can say the same thing in the songs, curse everybody out, mm. just make them keep dancing 
and they won't, you know, feel it that bad. I mean, we're obviously going to come and talk volubly about your music career, which, I mean, became enormously successful. But, I mean, as, in, in point of fact, your father himself became a victim of the very thing that he wanted you to, be pr to, to prevent, you know, from happening That's to you. Right. I mean, he got arrested as a politician, mm -hmm. got detained on trumped-up charges, but was eventually exonerated, wasn't mm -hmm. he? Well, he, no, he wasn't. Um, not that I remember. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison. And, uh, what was that for? Uh, treason. Right. And, and in Africa, treason can mean anything. And that was under Tubman, was that it? That was under President Tubman. Right. That can mean anything. Having lunch with the Chinese ambassador, or who else was socialist at the time? Probably Nereri, etc. So um, he went into prison. And then uh, Mr. Tubman passed away, and President Tolbert, mm. on his ascension as president, released him out of prison. Okay, so it was Tolbert it who It was did. Tolbert who right. released okay. him. So, I mean, I don't know if there was any ceremony to say, we exonerate him or right. anything. The goodwill of the president brought but him But I mean, out. what impact did that have on you oh, as a young lady? I was 20 years old. I was 20 years old. And Charles, you know, the interesting thing is, uh, it's almost as if we were, we were prepared. We were prepared for it mm. in terms of the education Father had given us, enlightening us to what happens in Africa mm. and so forth. I, I remember this man, you couldn't use his car. Imagine my father was an ambassador in Sierra Leone and Kenya. And he refused for us to use his Mercedes Benz. You couldn't use the official the, car. Well, you know. Basically, he was he was the, the real deal, the yes. proper thing. Yes, I mean, he wouldn't let us use his car to go to the embassy, uh, uh, to movies or anything. Like my counterparts, maybe the Israeli ambassador, Ugandan right. ambassador, so on, okay. allowed their children. And he always said, I'm the ambassador. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, stay with us. We're going to talk some more. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with Miata Fambule, one of Africa's finest voices. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Enyakulu. Now, my special guest today, Miata Fambule, is one of the African continent's most respected and popular vocalists whose works have stood the test of time from the 1970s through to today. For decades, Miata has moved African audiences from Nigeria to South Africa and everywhere in between with her intense personal feeling of classic reggae, as well as her singular mix of a sort of freewheeling jazz, pop and blues with a dash of Caribbean calypso thrown in. It's made her one of the giants of African music and she's spoken about in reverent terms alongside legends such as Miriam Makeba and Letambulu, singers who more than any others have epitomized African song at its most soulfully charged. And Miata stands tall amongst them. Yes, let's go. Chicken Necro for day. Go, 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 go
Brilliant, isn't it? And my special guest today, the gloriously effulgent Miata Fambule, is still with me in the studio. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, that, that was an absolute smash, wasn't it, Coco Lioko? That's what they tell me, Charles. <laughs> I didn't make over two thousand pounds on that music. Yeah, but that was a different era, wasn't it? Imagine. I mean, they, you you would make the song, you'd be famous, but yes. you wouldn't be rich. You for didn't it. make a dime, so it just like said, oh, okay. Uh, well, somebody made money out of it. Yes, uh, we won't call any names. You know, it's so, it's so <laughs> yeah, long Yeah, let's ago. try not to. It's so long ago. But you, you of course, you, you studied at the American Musical mm -hmm. and Dramatic, Dramatic Academy, Academy and eventually performed at the famous Apollo Theatre mm -hmm. in, in New York. Was that when you decided to make a career as a singer? I think all along I knew I was going to do the singing. Uh, make the career of the singing. Um, we were just going through the academic Right. You wanted thing. to get the academics out yes, of the way. Yes, to satisfy. Well, but you didn't feel conflicted. No, not at all. Not at all. Um, I enjoyed it because at the American Musical and Dramatic Academy, mm. I, I, I learned about stagecraft, which a lot of artists have no idea Absolutely. about. Absolutely. I learned about stagecraft, I learned about voice control, voice training, um, you know, some good tips that have carried me along mm. and, 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 you know, have made me slightly different from other artists on the stage, you know. I, I, have, no, I have no qualms or no fright about getting on a stage after, say, um, Patti LaBelle or yes. whoever. <coughs> because I, I've learned the craft mm. and the craft has kept me going. So you have that confidence. I have that confidence. And, and of course you sang at the inauguration of mm -hmm. President William Tolbert, did you? Oh, oh my goodness, you went back. Well, How I much mean, reading did you do about well, me? Well, what I'm trying to understand, because I think that was around 73 or, or so. Uh, 72. Um, yeah, that must have yes. been quite a moment for you. Yes. W was that because I mean that that's a that's a that's a, a singular moment, isn't it? I mean, was that what decided because you were pretty much abroad? Yes. You then decided, hey, there is some traction in coming to start as a musician, which well, you attempted a few years previously and it right. didn't quite work. Right. But you wanted to try it again. Yes. Um, in Africa, I think I think um, the people in Liberia were already convinced that I was going to, I was doing the singing. So um, combined with the fact that my father was released in December 1971, mm. um, there were those who felt, you know, come and be part of it, come and say thank you, sing. And I jumped to that opportunity. I was, I should have been, you know, more excited mm. about that. Now that you read it to me, I realized it was a very, very important mm. thing, but for me... Seminal moment. Yes, uh, no, but it was, coming, it was coming home to meet my father out of prison. Mm. Yes, Mr. Talbot, I'm very, very thankful. Because, you know, it was long after, many years after that I realized Mrs. Nixon was at that inauguration and some other very important Mrs. People. Nixon, the wife of the former American yes, president, they were uh, at that Richard Nixon. That's right, they were at that inauguration, <laughs> but I didn't even... I mean, you were still pretty young at the time, let's face it. <laughs> yes, yeah, um, And of course, coming from a political family yourself, mm -hmm. you would have been aware of how remarkable the peaceful transition from Tubman to Tolbert appeared <laughs> to the outside world at a yes. time when Africa was convulsed by political turmoil. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem, which may not have been obvious to non-Liberians then, was that Liberia was a one-party state. Mm -hmm. Um, where civil liberties were limited, the judiciary and the legislative branches were effectively subservient to the president. Mm -hmm. Still exists today. Mm. That's the African story, isn't yeah, it? It still exists today. If it existed in 1968, mm. it still exists today. We, had, we just had a new president elected. We had uh, uh, Africa's first female um, president. It was mm. the same thing. Um, the whole system, the whole system is at the direction of, of the executive of branch, the executive, basically. Of yeah. the executive. 
Uh, and in spite of the fact that President Tolbert initiated some reforms um, and was subsequently re-elected mm -hmm. in 1975 because mm -hmm. he was vice president, right. took over from, to from Tubman. That's right. Um, he was criticized for failing to address the deep economic disparities um, between the Americo-Liberians mm -hmm. uh, who had dominated the country since independence uh, and the various indigenous ethnic groups that were the majority of the population. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately was his undoing, wasn't it? Mr. Talbot couldn't move fast enough. He knew what he had to do. But you have to understand that Mr. Talbot was just one individual mm. within a party. Within a system. Within a system. And he may, had, uh, he may have wanted all of the changes. I mean, we called him Speedy when he first took over because he was all over the place. We got to do this, we got to do that. And, and the young people like myself um, really felt that, yes, he can do it. But the problem was so deeply mm. rooted and fundamental within our system so that Mr. Talbot was at loggerheads with a lot of his people in the party because he wanted to move away mm. from that same from system. From the old system. From the old and, system. And that was a problem. And that was a problem. Okay. And I think that was what finally did him in. Did him in. Stay with us. We want to talk with you some more. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with one of Africa's finest singer-songwriters, Miata Fambule. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Arise interview, where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anya Goldu. Now, my special guest today, who deserves thunderous applause, is Miata Fambule, an outstanding Liberian and African singer, songwriter, and producer. She's had and still has an outstanding career as a performing artist, spanning more than 50 years of enormous success, starting from when she was just 16, through to talent shows at the famous Apollo Theatre in New York and subsequently singing and performing with the likes of Donald Byrd, Hugh Masekela, and a host of other big name stars. She's still best known though for her two mammoth hit singles, Amo Sakesa and Coco Lioko, as well as this one, Oba, which she performed at the 2011 Nobel Peace Prize concert. Take a listen. Oh, 
and the amazingly talented Mieta Fambule is still with me here in the studio. That was a lovely song, absolutely. And you played that at the 2011 Nobel Peace Prize con ceremony, basically. Yes. Um, and just returning to your career, I mean, we've talked a lot about the politics around your growing up and all the things that happened, but returning to your career as a singer and performer. You worked with the famous Hugh Masakela. Loved him to death. Um, Loved him and you toured the US with him. Mm -hmm. And and I've met Hugh Masakela. I met him in Calabar a few years ago because he oh, came okay. for the Calabar oh, Festival. Ranch. Yeah, no, no. He actually came to Calabar, the city itself, okay. for the Calabar Festival. And I interviewed him. And my eldest brother has been, my eldest brother, Tony, mentioned your name, Tony. Tony. Tony, he, he's a brilliant pianist. He's a lawyer, but also brilliant on the piano. Yeah. And he was a huge fan of Hugh Masakela. So I got to hear a lot of Hugh Masakela's songs. And that would have been quite an experience for you. Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, it was experience. You know, the thing about it is, um, I don't know, for us mm. here in West Africa, in Liberia, we used to say, everybody is a star. Okay, so y you don't have anything. So uh, in that period, when you meet a Hugh Masakela, mm. you don't know he's as big as, you know, he's our he's brother. He's just Hugh Masakela. He's just Hugh Masakela. <laughs> yeah. You know, we all hanging out um, with Francis Fuster and, and, and the Tony Allens, you know, mm. with regular people. So you, you never... But, but of course, for the rest of us, those were toweringly yes, huge stars. You know, I, I learned... I learned from Masakela again, performing on the stage, mm. taking your audience with you. That's one, one of the things I learned. Sure. And uh, I've always treasured it. But yes, um, he gave wonderful advice. Um, he recorded my very first album. Uh, we did it in Apapa. Mm, yes, I was told it was in, in Lagos. In Lagos, yeah. Apapa, and with the whole Francis Fuster and Baranta, and then Hezule. That he was that the Amosa Kesa? No, 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 no. Okay. no Amosa Kesa had already Came late. been. Okay, it had been released already. It, had it? Yes, hadn't right. been released as yet. I'm, I'm thinking of the timing. Masakela was 75, 76. Mm. And then I went after Fest like 77. To yes, Britain, of and course. that's when I did. Yes, Abu you were one of the the, the um, head, one of the stars at, at Festac. Really? Yeah. I don't think so. You don't know how we fought to get scheduled and this and where we. Oh. Yeah, but mm -hmm. I think organizing things at that time was not quite the same as today because a lot of it was done by the government rather than by, you know, private companies and so on who specialize in those sorts of things. Yeah, but I'm saying, and that's the same story mm. everywhere. Governments have no business organizing festivals. Mm. Government, government has no business trying to organize a wedding or a presentation or an Independence Day. That's why we have people who specialize in that events organizer mm. they have different names for yeah them. but it's evolved now though hasn't it i mean it's evolved in in many certainly in, in nigeria it's kind of moved forward because they they tend to um i saw i saw half a program i saw half a program the other day on nigerian television mm. um involved with the well that's a slightly different story nigeria oh. <laughs> no I'll but, leave it at that. no but you see charles you see um, I've always taken and placed Nigeria mm. where she belongs. She's our leader. Well, she's supposed to be. She's our leader. leader. You cannot have 200 million of us with the kind of economy you have, mm. manufacturing industry that you have the potential to create that can absorb the 2 million unemployed in mm. Liberia. The, the, the two emphasis is in on Sierra the word Leon. potential. Well, let's not uh, let Nigeria take away from, yeah. from, because, I mean, that's a totally different story. No, but, yeah. but I mean, yeah. here you are, Miata. Yeah. You, you've obviously performed with lots of artists. You're talking about Hugh Masakela. Yeah. We're talking about Donald Byrd, all the yes. rest of them, um, both African and non-African. Who would you say of that lot has really inspired you? That's so unfair. I know. That's why I asked it. <laughs> oh, because well, I, you could mention more than one. Because I mean, I, yeah, I mean, 
uh, and working with the Donald Byrd at the time mm. exposed me to the whole jazz phenomena. Mm. And that was in 1973-74, long before Masakela, before I'd even met Masakela. Mm. And Duke Pearson, um, he had the big band down at the village gate, and I would go there, sit, and j listen, techniques and crafts, etc. And I think when he got a little tired and wanted to give them a little excitement, then he would introduce this African girl mm. to come on. And I'd do one song, and I'll be very, very happy and proud, get a good reception. But that was some of the building of the career. Um, who else in America? But I presume that with um, being close to people like Hugh Masakela would have brought you closer to some of those exiled South Africans like Miriam Makeba and Miriam all the rest Makeba, of them. Miriam Makeba, Jonas Gwanga, um, he just died quite recently, Lucky Ranku, mm. yes, uh, those are names that, uh, it was interesting, he didn't, he didn't really introduce me to them physically, mm. but the fact that I had you worked in the same Masakela, circles, yes. Yeah. So when I got to London, it was like, oh, you, the Liberian girl, <laughs> that Masakela is working with. So. And there were people like OCB Sarah and all the rest oh, of them. Oh, uh, OCB Sarah, yes. I mean, that was a foregone conclusion. Mm. Uh, they were my Ghanaian brothers right next door, and I used to go over to Mac Tonto's house and chill. Mac Tonto has passed on. Oh, you know. my dear brother and friend. We've actually had them on this program. We've had Teddy Ose, yes. Wendell Richardson, That's all the right. rest of them. Brilliant, yes. brilliant musicians. Yeah. But I mean, let me ask you this. What brings you to Nigeria at this time? Especially um, this COVID time, right? Well, I was just going to say, not that anything's stopping you from coming here whenever you want, because of course it is a sort of home away from home for you, because yes. I mean, you lived here at some point, mm -hmm. but what brings you hither this time, as they say in England? You know, uh, we've been going through a lousy period. One what, your, your microphone's falling off there. I'm going into my bosom. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I'll try not to look, but I mean, the, um, <laughs> we've, we've got to make sure that, that it, it's clipped on How properly. How did that happen? I'm moving too much? Yeah. Um, oh, let the microphones just roll. We're going to... Okay, yeah, you that's that's it? good enough. So let, let's, let's continue. Yes. I haven't been anywhere for a year because of COVID. And um, I'm still petrified, etc. But there comes a time, there's come certain occasions... Mm that you cannot just let pass. And yesterday, Sunday, was the birthday of a woman that I respect next to my mother, that I love next to my mother. And she was turning 80 yesterday. I'm talking about Mrs. Ajoke Murutala Mohammed. Of course, that's uh, the former head of state's that's wife. Right. wife. Yes. Yeah. And so I had to, I had to come in just be a part of the ceremony. That's my family. That's my family. The Mohammeds and the Bensons are my Nigerian family. Well, that's lovely. Yes. Because, I mean, that's a, a very well-respected family in, in Nigeria here and beyond. Um, the, the family of um, Muratala Mohammed. Oh, I love the guy. Mm. I love the guy, honey. Well, a lot of people have a lot of time for him in Nigeria. <laughs> yeah. but, but let's move on from that. Um, and actually look at some of those songs that you made that became enormous hits. Like, let, let's start with Amosa Kesa, for example. Amosa Kesa. W what language is that? What does oh, it actually you, mean? You will love this. You will love this, because I asked the question. We grew up with Amosa Kesa, Amosa Kesa. That's where we grew up. And I just said, okay, um, let's pull on the history. Mm. What does Amosa Kesa mean? It's a... Uh, 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 how do I, uh, the word I want is um, the colloquialization right. of the English. I'm almost satisfied. You're kidding. I ain't kidding. <laughs> now that is extraordinary. You know we have... I'm almost satisfied. Is I'm, almost almost a case. A case. I'm almost satisfied. I'm almost. And bring that in from North Carolina or georgia mm. or kentucky or wherever our return brothers came 
and they're singing Amo Sakisa, and we the indigenous, it sounds like Amo Sakisa. <laughs> Now that is superb. And then that, and that, through, that. And through the ages, by the time we learn it, I learned it in the 50s, is Amo Sakisa. That's brilliant. Yes. And are you, you're not therefore American Liberian. No. You're not American Liberian. You, you belong to one of the indigenous ethnic groups. I'm a Vai Gribble girl. Okay, well that's fascinating because mm -hmm. I mean that there was because of the way that your father kind of mixed with all the politicians who yes. dominated and they were all America Liberians. Right. Tolbert, right. you know, Tubman, exactly. all the rest of them. But but in this era in this era, um, I am now thrown into the category of being an America. Right. Because because of the privilege. Because of that. the privilege, because I've been I've got an education right. and I moved in the privileged circle, etc. Okay. So to the population You're one of them. I'm we'll one of we'll them. talk some more. We'll be back in yes. one hot second. You're watching the Arise interview, plenty more still ahead, as we continue our chat with the enduringly dashing Liberian singer and songwriter Miata Fambule. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anikola. My special guest today is the famous Liberian singer, Mieta Fambule, who also has a widespread reputation as a first-rate songwriter, composer, and producer, not to mention a mother and grandmother as well. But beyond the fact that she's an A-list musician and performer and is clearly widely traveled and vastly experienced, having worked with and performed with some of the world's best artists, Miata is also a crusader for African unity and advancement, having lived and grown up in Sierra Leone, Kenya, Nigeria, the UK, and the US. And she's, of course, a humanitarian dedicated to the cause of African children, especially the girl child, who she says has been ravaged by the politics of war, deprivation, hunger, and poverty. She currently runs an educational outreach program in Liberia, which provides scholarships and mentoring to both girls and boys. And the staggeringly talented Mieta Fambule is still with me in the studio. Thank you for staying with us. And beyond your enviably illustrious career as a singer, for which you, of course, found fame, um, you've also become a strong advocate for women's and children's issues. You've founded a school for girls. You've give out scholarships to them, and you work to get women in high government positions. How's that going? Not very good right now. Right, challenging. Well, um, I have to be very honest with you. In 2017, we had a change of government in Liberia. Mm. A government that I knew that was not going to be happy with me. You had the football that come in. Yes. Right. And I don't know, you know, I don't think football. And you clearly don't play football. Do and you? I don't play football. <laughs> you know, I don't even understand it. It's only when the World Cup comes, you know that I, I, I listen because mm. I'm waiting for Nigeria or Senegal or Ivory Coast. So I don't even understand football. So Charles, I just decided, you know, step aside a bit. Take a break. Mm. Sit down, look, as <laughs> Bola Ige would say. And that's what I've been doing for the past three years. I've been in Accra, Ghana. Okay. Another sanctuary of mine. Yes. Mm. You really are a world <laughs> citizen, aren't you? A true uh, African. Yes, yes, yes. Very yes. pan-African in your outlook. We're all the same. We're but all the same. We all look alike. Yeah, that's true. We all eat the same food, except we cook it different. Mm. We all have the same traditions. We have the same proverbs. Everybody eats fufu, don't they? Everybody, they eat fufu. Today, I eat pounded yam. Good. I like mm -hmm. pounded yam, although it makes you a bit fat, to be honest. Um, At my age, I'm not worried. I prefer worried. plantain ball, yes, which is slightly I less I fat. I eat it all, but at my age, Charles, I'm not thinking about <laughs> fat or slim or whatever. Well, you're gorgeous. Thank you, my I darling. I have to say. Thank and you, you made a bid for the Liberian Senate, Senate. Can you in, believe? in 2014. Can you um, believe that? How did that end up, and what did it teach you about Liberian politics? Oh, it's horrible. I can imagine. It was absolutely horrible. There was no system, um, absolutely no system. Everybody went in the race, and um, 
with the footballer. Mm. I was in the race. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I was in the race with the footballer mm. and the president's son, heir apparent. And I was just, it, it, it was just an, I don't want to say arrogant mood. It was an angry mood. Mm. It was an angry mood because I felt neither should have been in the race. And, and most of the caliber politicians mm. stood aside. You will not believe that even the ruling party did not put forward a candidate because nobody wanted to challenge the footballer or the president's son. Mm. So I said, no, nah, I ain't going to let you off so easy. And that's so how you went for it. I went for it. I went for it because the women wanted it. Mm. I had been spoken to by women like, Sis Mieta, why don't you go? You got to go. You so and so and so and so. I said, well. And after Sir Leaf, mm -hmm. I mean, th that seemed to be logical, wouldn't it? For, yes. For, for another sort of, you know, yeah, prominent Liberian woman oh. to step into the breach, as yes. it were. Oh. But it, it didn't happen. It didn't right. happen. The politics of the day, quite messy. Yeah, no, I, I can imagine. Um, but looking at your pedigree, which is clearly um, more political than artistic, mm -hmm. um, I mean, so it's not a yes. surprise that you went for the Senate. Uh, how did you navigate past the, you know, the, the political side of you? Mm -hmm. And because clearly you, you've spent more time as a singer yes. than the political side, but, but you can see yourself being drawn back to that politics. Yes. I, w I will always be drawn into into the politics mm. because I love my country. I consider myself a patriot or a nationalist. So whether I'm in well, Kabachistan or wherever, I'm interested in what's going on mm. on this continent. You know, to, e to just put it into Liberia, I think you're limiting me. When I wake up in the morning, I'm interested in what has happened in Nigeria, what's happening in Ghana. What's happening in Liberia, mm. Sierra Leone, Guinea, my neighbors? Because whatever happens in Ivory Coast goes wrong, it's going to affect me. Of course. You understand? So wherever I am, and, and it's unfortunate that um, in order to give public service, it's considered politics. Because I'm not a politician at all. But were you not slightly worried? I mean, Liberia went through you might call it two civil wars, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the killing, the 250,000 dead, mm -hmm. and, and the, the, the rage and the anger and all the things percolating underneath. Mm -hmm. Did, didn't that make you a little less inclined to want to go into politics? No, because I felt that they needed, um, our society still needs more mothers. Mm. Our, our society is still traumatized, very, very traumatized, and you know, Charles, people just run it off. Oh, yeah, Liberia had a civil war, and they've gone back to democracy. Give me a break. We have over probably one million people in my country that are traumatized from that war. They've never gotten their lives together. And as a result, parents have not been able to take care of children. So we have thousands of delinquent children, and we have drug addicts. Mm drug addicts and our children are dropping out of school and going to the ghetto. And presumably that's one of the reasons you, you, you started helping children yes. in, in your and, and so I just felt we need people in there who genuinely care, who genuinely know what our society needs. Mm. But obviously, hey, they were not ready for the caring mother and they, you know, they took the football player and, and so we're playing football now. Well, <laughs> it's not over yet. Um, you, you, of course, um, an accomplished singer, songwriter, producer, widely, <laughs> you know, um, traveled, hugely respected globally, a humanitarian and a crusader for Africa. What haven't you done that you'd like to do? I suppose politics could be one of them, couldn't it? No, the politics is not it's not a personal ambition. No, it's not a personal ambition. Right. It's not a personal ambition. And, and, you know, and, and, and that's the problem, you know. Um, as long as I have my music, that's my personal. Hmm. Um, the other is 
you know giving back service giving right. back but well, you asked me what I would like to do and anybody out there listening uh, who can give me a ticket to Cuba I've been to Cuba. Oh, you see. I'm afraid I can't give you a ticket, but I've been there. <laughs> you see, I want to go to Cuba. I love the place. Oh, I've heard so much. I about was all it. over the place. Cuba. Yeah. I mean, Havana yeah. beaches, Vera Dira, all the rest of it. I want to go and hook up with. We, the we've had the Cuban ambassador here a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I'd like to go and do some music that side. I think that would be brilliant. Yes, I've, yeah. I've long. They've for got it, African roots there. Yes, definitely, yeah. and and bring it together, and bring it together. Well, I, I hope that we will be talking about your trip to Cuba the next time we meet. Yeah, well, you can make it happen. I hope we. I hope someone will. Uh, Miata Fambule, I want to thank you very much. Oh, indeed. Charles, thank you. Thank I've you very much it. for being a wonderful <laughs> guest. Thank you. Thank you, dear. That's it for this edition of The Arise Interview. Join me again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.